This is Byron Hurt. Stay tuned. WILL's Youth Media Workshop has more to say about hip-hop beyond beats and rhymes. Coming up next. All right, Byron, let's start off with you. You mentioned uh, watching the videos that was, was one of the um, videos one evening, and the content of those videos inspired you to make this film. Uh, was that the only instance that encouraged you to move forward with this project, or was it more of a long-term view <coughs> of your work and what you were discovering and working with young people? Well, the, question, the answer to that question is yes, absolutely. Um, I could not have made this film if I did not begin learning about gender issues when I graduated from college um, at Northeast University in Boston. Um, I was pretty much like any other typical guy. You know, I grew up as a, a jock. Um, I went to college, I played college football. Um, I pledged a fraternity. So I, I was very much sort of like immersed in, into male culture. And then when I graduated, as you saw in the film, I went through a program called the Mentors and Violence Prevention Program, and that program changed my life. It just changed my, my it just changed the way I saw myself in the world. It made me um, question the way that I had been raised as a guy um, to not even consider things like sexism and men's violence against women, um, and not to really question the way that I had been socialized as a man to, to handle conflict, you know. I thought about all of the different fights that I had been in as a young dude, or you know, growing up, you know, fighting against guys for very stupid reasons, senseless reasons, and, and not being um, capable of backing down from confrontation because I was afraid of what my boys would think about me um, if I, if I, you know, tried to work things out peacefully or whatever. And so, you know, learning, learning about gender issues helped inform me to make this film. Um, I, would not have, I wouldn't have had the language to make this film had I not started to learn about things like masculine identity, um, sexism, misogyny, which is something I had heard of before, but it wasn't something I really knew or understood about. I didn't know what it meant. Um, you know, misogyny means the hatred of women. So like these were all new things that I was learning as a dude. So all of those things led to me making this film. And, and you know, I had said this a number of different times today, you know, it did take courage to make this movie, man. It took a lot of courage, you know, because at the time that I, I was really seriously thinking about making this film, it was around a time when anybody who said anything negative about hip hop, you were considered a hater. You know, you were considered somebody who was you know, doing something that was against the culture, or you were trying to shut the culture down, you were, you know, all those kind of ridiculous things. And, you know, I say this, I made this film because I love hip hop culture. I made this film because I want to make hip hop culture better, you know what I'm saying, than it is. Nas came out with the CD, Hip Hop Is Dead. You know, I want this film and the criticism that comes out of all of this to breathe life into hip hop. You know what I'm saying? Because that's what hip hop is. And hip hop has so much potential. Hip hop has so much power, um, but you know we have to begin to challenge and be critical of the things that are holding hip hop back. So there you go. Thank you. Hip hop is a, a way to express yourself to, by putting words together to a rhythm, a beat, and lyrics. That's what it is to me. When did hip hop first touch your life? Um. I think I had to have been in like what seventh grade, eighth grade, and at my first, you know, my first serious crush was Dougie Fresh, and you know, my first real fashion item was one of those Coca-Cola rugby shirts, and we called ourselves the Coca-Cola Crew, right? And you know, like that was that was, you know, we are the hip hop generation in a real way. I don't. I don't remember when hip hop didn't touch my life. Like that was my introduction to popular culture. Was hip hop. And that's, I think, you know, one of the things that makes this a really key moment is that uh, finally a generation of activists and thinkers and, you know, cultural producers are coming of age who have never lived outside of hip hop to be able to stage certain kinds of critiques of our own, you know? Uh, probably when I was in like third or fourth grade when I was listening to, uh, what was it? Songs does in harmony with my dad. We would ride down the street, and right there, I just started loving that hip hop. Um, well, 
I grew up with a brother who's a DJ, and my uncle was a DJ, so me and my brother living in the projects, we got one room, bunk bed, and all around the floor are crates. So I found myself, when he was out of the bedroom, digging in the crates. So I was immersed in hip hop culture from a very early age, and I guess um, I learned different ways of how to express myself through hip hop. One of those ways was in writing. I think I started listening to hip hop back in fifth grade. I started listening to Eminem and people were telling me that his lyrics weren't good and all that stuff and I, it just made me want to listen to it more. And after I started listening to it, I started writing my own music and he inspired me to write. Let me see me. I'm a little bit younger, but I think I was in fifth grade. It was like uh, this group called Fool Snake. I don't know if y'all know about Fool Snake. The dark one with the twist, it's rap real fast. That was really right there, so that's what kicked me off. I know my roots though, Grandmaster Band, Flash, Fierce Five, Melly Mel, you know, Jewish Group, Jungle Brothers, all that, Native Tones, I know my roots, like it down. Is what we're really seeing and depicted in the film and even what we're hearing in the radio really hip hop? When we start thinking in its truest instance, in the spirit of it, is it what we're really seeing or are we seeing and hearing something else and what is that? Hip hop to me is just all the same. They talk about the same stuff and I think that you can make rhymes without talking about killing and all that stuff. And I write music and it's not always like about bad things. I could write about, you know, doing positive, but I know people won't like that as much. So I think it really depends on who you talk to. But, you know, one, one, one thing that, you know, everybody should know is that hip hop is nuanced. You know what I'm saying? And it's, it's way more nuanced and complicated than even my film gets to. You know what I mean? And I think that's one of the things that is overlooked in, in rap music and hip hop culture are the nuances to hip hop that makes hip hop so so brilliant. You know what I'm saying? So intriguing, so fascinating, so dope, so hot. So um, undeniably um, black and Latino. You know what I'm saying? And so hard. So. What is hip hop depends on who you're talking to. I think those of us who are older, who have a reference point, you know, from when hip hop started and have seen all of these various incarnations of hip hop, I think that we have an affinity or a love for what was once a lot more vibrant and diverse um, than what we see today. Not to sound like, you know, a nerd here, but. I think one of the things that we have to know is, right, is that cultures develop, they evolve, and our idea that we can sort of choose a moment and decide that there's like this stagnant, authentic culture, whether it's hip hop or whether it's, you know, Western civilization or whether it's like the mating rituals of, you know, ex people that we learn about in whatever kind of, you know, anthropology class we take, right, the fact is that all cultures evolve and change, and so, when we recognize that hip hop, like any other culture, evolves and changes, then we actually have the capacity to take responsibility for the ways in which it evolves and changes. It's not something that we can sort of disavow or say, oh, that's something over there, we have no control over it, it's just clear channels, you know, thing now. Like, it's a culture, and we're all part of producing culture, we're all part of, you know, reproducing it, of spreading it, of choosing what directions it goes in, and, it's not any more real or less real, it's just different. I mean, and this goes back before hip hop. I mean, the arguments that we're having now about the sexism and the misogyny in hip hop, and this doesn't make it better or worse, but this is the same kinds of problems people had with Jelly Roll Morton's, you know, incredibly misogynist lyrics. This is the problem we have with toasting, which is, you know, early black male <coughs> culture, right? It goes back to the beginning of the century. These are long standing issues of patriarchy, of misogyny that need to be addressed within cultural forms as they change and as they evolve. How do we begin defining it as something else? And, 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 I, and I pose that question because we know there's been corporate involvement since day one. And we know that, that, that your, your film demonstrated uh, and there was discussion about uh, we can't get record deals because they're not signing us. And so we see the hand wielding where the, how the culture evolves. And so the question that becomes is, are we still seeing true authentic culture and is it still that? And that's why I continue to pose that question and challenge you on, on that. Because where do young people start introducing something else within the context and the frame 
of the original spirit of hip hop culture in order to get us out of this muck, if you will. This film is about manhood in hip hop, right? But I think it's much, it's about something much more than that. It's, it's, about, it's about like manhood in American culture. It's about patriarchy. It's about the collision of like hyperaggression and, and sexism and misogyny and capitalism and um, materialism. It's like all of these things that are colliding in American culture that makes hip hop so viable, that makes hip hop so uh, saleable to, to a large mainstream audience. And that's one thing that I, 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 you know, I, I want people to know and acknowledge. Like We're having this conversation about hip hop, but really, this conversation needs to be broadened out to discuss manhood, masculine, masculinity, masculine identity, what it means to be a man, how you and how you and how you have been socialized and conditioned to see maleness in American culture. Because I know that there are a lot of young men in this room who have been affected by patriarchy in negative ways. I'm sure that there are a lot of guys in this room who maybe grew up in a home and saw their mother being abused by their father or disrespected by their father, and they were deeply hurt by it. It had a really negative impact on them. You know what I mean? There are a lot of young boys and men out here who know that whatever they're seeing in, in, in the music, in the music videos, they know it's wrong, but we cosign, or we laugh. You know, when we see images that, you know, are not intent, they're not really funny, but, but we, we'll laugh because it taps into something that we believe, you know? So like, we gotta start challenging this and we gotta start educating young boys to reject this because that's the only way that this is gonna change. Young boys have to be educated that it's okay to break outside of that box and be who we really are and not feel like we have to perform a certain kind of manhood to the world around us. I think that's the reason black males get pulled over every day. As they talk about selling drugs on those hip hop videos and all this other stuff, there might be some cops or whatever like, okay, they, since they talk about it there, why aren't they doing it here? So I think that could be a reason why we get pulled over in our community every day. And it's not making us look good at all. Is there anything that you're seeing or hearing in hip hop right now that upsets you? Um, some of the times I don't like what you know the guys say about girls and I don't think it's right and if it's like that then I probably won't listen to the music but at the same time it's still like you know if the beat is good then you'll be found you know listening to it but I don't think that the girls if they know what the song is about they don't have to go to the, the video or you know the audition or whatever I think they can you know say no and then you know the guy won't have anything for the video. Yeah I mean a uh, male calling another woman a bitch is like a thing that I was raised never to do. I mean, I figure if a man calls a woman a bitch, I put myself in that picture and that's like my mother. How would I feel if somebody called my mother a bitch? And I love my mom. I do. And if somebody were to call my mom a bitch, I would, I would flip. So, I mean, that's one of my biggest pet peeves right there. So, but I'm only one person, ain't much I can do too. I mean, stop that. You know, it, it took, you know, when I first started doing this, honestly, I was very reluctant to do it. You know what I'm saying? I, I was reluctant because I was afraid of what my boys were gonna say about me. I was, I was afraid of being ridiculed by my fraternity brothers. I'm a member of a Mega Sci Fi fraternity, you know, which has its own issues and its own problems in terms of its hyper masculine identity, you know? Um, but, you know, Something is some somebody gave me the courage, you know, to do it, and I just I want everybody else to feel like you know you have the courage to do something because we all do. Now I can actually stand up here with confidence and say violence against women is whack. Mm -hmm. Guys who call women bitches and hoes are whack. You know what I'm saying? They they don't they don't you know command my respect. They're not men, in my opinion. Me personally, like two years ago. Man, this dude right here with something else. I tell you that one. For real. Every, every B I T C H, every ho, every nigga, every I pop you, I shoot you. You can hear it in my catalog of music before two years ago. You know what I'm saying? But I feel like I've been here in a place here for a real reason. I'm here for a personal purpose. We all got a certain assignment. And I don't want to fail my assignment. So the man upstairs or the mother upstairs scared the mess out of me two years ago to made me change my train of thought. Made me reevaluate myself 
and reprogram myself, you know what I'm saying? So now I got a project coming out called What a Difference a Day Rains. And on that project, I got a song on there that made my grandma cry. Now, two years ago, met MF for this, MF for that, shoot, bang, bang, that's all you heard. And I'm ashamed of that music, but that music was me. I was a product of my environment, uh, my upbringing, how I was raised, and what was around me, what influenced me, and what brainwashed me. You know what I'm saying? So I ain't, I ain't not ashamed of it. I accept it, I embrace it. But today is a new person. Today is a new being. And I'm proud to do then. And what I'm more proud to do today, able to speak, because I wouldn't even able to say what I'm saying to y'all right now. I wouldn't have been out there. Straight up dude back then would have been out there or up there. You know what I'm saying? So for that, for that you can change and you can make a change. You know what I'm saying? For, for me. So it's possible. Believe me, it's possible. Some women in videos don't don't dress like other women, like them, as they call it, hoes with no clothes on. Some, a lot of women don't even dress like that, but they wanna, media wants to put out the bad stuff about women and not the good stuff. And I don't think it's right, because a lot of people ain't even like that. What amazes me so much is when we talk about the music videos is that both of us, me and you, are watching the same videos, but when I see a guy with um, you know, a do-rag on or like slouch down pants, I don't think of him as a thug. But why do you think of me as a hoe? Because of the way I look. So it's like this weird kind of like construction that we have and that the way somebody looks um, connotes the way that they behave. But at the same time, I feel that black women don't have that same kind of understanding and that same kind of box um, about black about black men. The idea that you know we need to behave in certain kinds of ways to be respected and that there are these ideas about respectable black women is just the flip side of the idea that we're bitches and hoes in G-strings who can be used as an ATM machine, right? These are the same ideas about patriarchy and about the ways in which black female sexuality in particular, black female existence can be controlled. And I think, you know, one of the things that this film points out so brilliantly is that this is a larger issue of patriarchy. And this goes back years. You know, this goes back, Frederick Douglass writing his autobiography talking about, you know, the poor, his poor aunt who's getting whipped, but meanwhile he's going to go beat up the slave master and he's going to be a man and she's going to be a victim. You know, the idea that black men have sought to gain some kind of credibility in the eyes of a white supremacist society by claiming a kind of masculinity on the backs of black women is nothing new. And it's not about how women dress, and it's not about whether they're portrayed as hoes or they're portrayed as stay-at-home respectable women who need to be defended by their menfolk. These are all ways in which black men seek to fight white supremacy by leaving black women by the wayside. And that's the problem, right? That's what we need to take on. So, yeah. Well, just um, those are two excellent points. I just wanted to ask, um, just by a show of hands, was you, you raised a point, what can we do? Like, what can you do to change this? And I think one of the things that we can all do is do a much better job of being allies to women, you know, just being supportive to the issues that are important to them. You know, and I say that to myself too. You know, because there are some things that, you know, I'm married, there are some things that are, you know, big issues or important issues for my wife that I, don't, I may not necessarily see as important, you know, and or as important because they, they don't necessarily, um, they don't really hit me the same way. You know what I mean? But, but it's important for me to, to be open and to listen with a supportive ear. And I, I just wanted to just, um, See by a show of hands. How, how many guys here in this room have actually attended like a Take Back the Night rally or anything like that? Anybody? Any other? Any guy? That's actually pretty good. That's a good number of guys who have done so. Yes, I mean, as watching the movie, I figured that I shouldn't be supporting something that's not making my community better, helping my community grow. Even though that I do like hip-hop and I do listen to hip-hop all the time. I'm also supporting the negative image that they are portraying on me in my community. So yes, it made me think more or less about my community 
and not my own self. When you were speaking with some of the people uh, about homophobia in the in, in, in rap music and in hip hop, why do you believe that um, it's, it's so? Why, why did they like say that it was so taboo? Like, what what was it like? You know that you know that made it you know not acceptable? You know, and like even when the the the, the gentlemen, uh, the women, how they wanted to classify themselves were up there. You know, there were a lot of sneakers and. In, in the crowd, and, you know, and I was just wondering, you know, where does that, you know, type of stuff come from? You know, how do um, ideologies like that get formed, and why why can black men um, address homophobia and still be masculine? Why do you feel like a piece of your masculinity is taken away once you say something like that? So I think that's the question. You know, you know, some of the things that we see may sort of support our, you know, what, what already exists in our head about homosexuality and homophobia. Um, so I think that's why you hear certain people respond or or not respond or not ask questions about it because I think there's just a lot of discomfort around that subject matter. Um, and I think people are afraid. I mean, I think people are afraid that if they even have a conversation about homophobia or homosexuality, especially with guys, that your your own manhood is going to be put into question. Like your own, like just the association between. Um, well, just just if you raise a point about homosexuality. Or homo homophobia that people are going may think that you are somehow not masculine, you know, or that if you are supporting, if you're supporting in any way a homosexual lifestyle, that you in fact may be also gay, you know, and I think that's that prevents a lot of guys from speaking out publicly about it. I'm not I'm not threatened by it, but I am aware that people may queer me. Just because I'm raising the issues, or you no, know, may question whether or not I am gay or not. But honestly, it was a process for me. Like it wasn't like just like I woke up one morning and I was and I was able to question homophobia. You know what I'm saying? It, it, I had to really think deeply about myself. I had to be thinkly about you know my own attitudes about homosexuality. You know, and my own homophobic attitudes that existed inside of me. And then I had to really examine who I am. Like you know. I had to really just come to terms with the fact that I'm straight. I love women. You know, I'm straight. I'm a straight dude. And I don't really, at this particular stage in my life, I don't think there's anything that's going to change that. So I, why should I care what people are going to say about me or what people, how people may classify me or what people may, what kind of box people may put me in? Actually, I'm going to say something before we move on on this one. Um, I just, I want to clarify one thing that you just said, Barrett. I mean, I don't think, in fact, that loving women sexually, being physically attracted to women, makes it easier for people to stand up for women. I mean, the fact is, the long-standing political alliances between black gay men and black women are honestly much stronger than a lot of the long-standing political alliances between black straight men and black women. So I think that's one thing we need to clarify. And I guess the other thing that I'd say here is, you know, I heard the laughing and I understand the discomfort and I understand how hard these issues can be, but I think that one of the things that was most fascinating for me when watching this film was how it was okay for all of the rap artists to have the conversation about misogyny, to be called on what it means when they say bitch or when they say ho or when they talk about this kind of hyper-aggressive, hyper-masculine, you know, machismo that they present. But the minute that queerness came to the table, the conversation had to end, mm -hmm. right? It was a completely unacceptable conversation. And there were other things in the film that might have made people uncomfortable, but nothing got the reaction from this audience mm -hmm. that homosexuality did. And I guess something that really I think about a lot as a black queer person who loves hip hop and loves hip hop culture is what does it mean that as a culture, of people who have traditionally been marginalized, jailed, lynched, raped, killed because of our supposed deviant sexuality, what does it mean that we are so ready to throw those stones and to accept certain kinds of physical, economic, and psychological violence against other people because of their so-called deviant sexuality? And how much of that is Closing the film contextualized the idea that issues of homophobia, gender sexuality, misogyny need to be further explored, explored 
in black and brown communities. In addition, hip hop can play a crucial role in illuminating those issues, as well as ideas and practices of patriarchy that leads to social policy reform that provides a better quality of life for the exploited.